is on the subject of worship. I think I better if I turn my mic on. And worship is an important part of our lives as Christians. And worship changes us. There are a lot of things that change us. I like what James Montgomery Boyce said when he said, No one comes to know, honor, or worship God without being changed in the process. And that's a true statement. That comes from Romans 12, 1 and 2 about being a living sacrifice, about being renewed in our mind. We are transformed into the image of Christ. We are changed when we come to know God. And today our focus is upon the aspect of preaching or hear and hearing as worship. And that's an important aspect of our worship. The preaching of the gospel brings salvation. That's the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. We are to preach the Word of God that is the power of God, the salvation, Romans 1, 16, to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. One must hear, however, in order to benefit from its saving power. How could someone know the gospel or know how to be saved without being told how to be saved? That's neither, neither preacher. I think about the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. And when he was reading the skull of Isaiah, and Philip comes to him and says, Do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I except some, some man guide me? And so Philip began from that scripture where he was at and he preached Jesus. Paul talked about that in Romans 10 as well, about how shall they hear without a preacher. And so preaching is indeed an important aspect of worship and an aspect of our lives. We need to be ready to hear the gospel. We talked about the word last week, about how important it is to internalize the word of God. And so let's do that not only in our private study, but when the gospel is preached throughout the service. Preaching and hearing are linked together. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And how do we hear the Word of God? By having it preached or read to us. In the context of worship, preaching and hearing constitute the same act. The only distinction is the point of view. Who is doing what? Someone must preach in order, to, in order for the preaching to take place, and there must be those that hear I'm often uh, amazed at, at times whenever I have the opportunity, not only the opportunity to preach, but the opportunity to listen to someone being to, to preach. Because I need to learn too. And, and every time I preach, I, I, I first hear the message myself. And I apply it to my life. And then I apply it to others. That's the way it works. And I, obviously, not everyone can preach. But someone must preach for there to be hearers. Preaching and hearing is, in fact, one of the five acts of acceptable worship that we find in Scripture. Consider Acts 20 and verse 7, Paul preached on the first day of the week. And so let's notice our points this morning. Number one, preaching and hearing is to be done in the assembly during worship. Consider Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. We know the Old Testament, the Old Law is written for our learning, that we do patience and comfort. But the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. The Old Testament has its place that we can learn principles from. My mind drew, drew a blank. Have you ever forgotten which were your book? I, I've done that. I've done that so uh, a lot of a lot of times. Whenever someone's preaching and turn to this book, I'm like, I'm like, where's that book at? <laughs> Ezra, Nehemiah. There it is. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. All were gathered together, and all the people were gathered as one man at the square, which was in the front of the water gate. And they said to Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Yahweh had commanded to Israel. <coughs> then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, men, women, and all who could understand when listening on the first day of the seventh month. All were gathered together, and now Ezra is going to read the book of the law, verses 3 and 4, and he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. Now, that would be a long sermon. Can you imagine beginning at 9 o'clock and hearing a sermon that lasts for two or three hours? It's about the same amount as our, as our football games that we watch, but there's nothing better than hearing the word preached because that, that matters more than the physical nourishment and anything else. From early morning until midday in the presence of men and women, those who could understand and all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra described stood on a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose. 
for that purpose, for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. On his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Mal Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Ze Zechariah, and Mishalem on his left hand. Now, whether I said those names right, I don't know. They would tell me if they, they were here. But nonetheless, that's not uh, necessary for our study to know how to pronounce these names. But the, the, what the, the important thing is, is that preaching and reading of the law was taking place. And that then it's important to hear the word of God. And as we read the book of the law, verses 3 and 4, while the people stood with respect, verse 5. Notice this. And Ezra opened the book on, in the sight of all the people. He opens the book in the sight of all the people. And everybody is standing. Notice this. For when he was above all the people and when he opened it, all the people stood up. I've, I've seen it in places where when he had the scripture reading, the, the person that's doing the scripture reading will announce everyone to stand. And they would read the scripture. Well, there's a principle that's applied here. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to stand. There every time a scripture is read that people have to stand up. But it just shows a sign of respect given to the law of God. There is a respect that needs to be given whenever God's word is being proclaimed. Because God's word is what matters. And that and it needs to be respected. God's word has the authority. And not only did they stood, stood with respect, they worshipped, verse 6. Then Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. So we see worship in, in that sense in the Old Testament. Of course, we know that we don't worship under the, Old, uh, under the Old Testament laws today. That's been taken out of the way. We're under the law of Christ, but we still worship today. Worship God, worship to God has taken place always. And of course, Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread. That would be the Lord's Supper, and Paul preached at midnight. So you have two of the aspects of our worship in that one verse. And Paul preached in the congregation heard. We don't know when Paul started that sermon, but he preached at midnight. I've been interested to hear what he had to say, but nonetheless, it's not given to us. If we, if we needed to know, it would have been written down for us. The epistles, the word of God, were to be read and thereby heard in the assemblies. Consider Colossians 4.16. Book of Colossians, chapter 4 and verse 16. And when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. And this would be done publicly, and, and, and you could read the scriptures. And this letter to the Colossians would be read not only to the church of Colossae, but these other areas that would be surrounding surrounding that area. Uh, that preaching is to take place in the assembly is also implied in the following verses. That Number one, a woman is to be silent and not permitted to teach, 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Surely this does not mean that she can never open her mouth. Some people take the word silence in, in, that, in that passage to mean total silence. Well, if she, if she caused her hiccup, she, according to some, that, that would mean that she broke the law. That's not what that says. It means that the, the man is, is supposed to be the leader of that portion of, of, of the worship. In all aspects of worship, God has used men as leaders. And because and it gives the, it gives the reason why. Because Adam was formed first and then Eve. That's the way God has made it. And we need to give respect to God's law. And so preaching is to take place in the assembly. Uh, and that's... 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, and surely this does not mean that she, she can't open her mouth. Her silence is in regard to the assembly. There are times, and there, there's times, for example, in our Bible classes, that ladies make comments or may read the scriptures. That is fine. That is not in corporate worship. That she's not taking over or, or working in this. She is not leading the class. She is simply reading the scripture that has been asked to read. There is a difference. Now, it would be different if the woman tried to take over the class and teach the class. That means she would be usurping her authority. That's what it means to usurp the authority, is to take over the class or to, or to, to put herself into a position that God has not given her to be a leader. And that's not the case. But nonetheless, what I'm trying to get you to see is that preaching is done in the assembly. It is an important part. 
So we know that preaching or hearing is to be done in the assembly during worship. And number two, what are the responsibilities of the preacher, the one that's proclaiming the message in worship? That is important. Number one, he is to preach the word. Paul says, I charge you. That's an order. That is a command. And Paul says, preach the word. Whose word? God's word. It's his I have no authority to change it. I have no authority to add to or take from. There, in the old law and in the, and in the law of Christ, we are warned not to add to or take from. Paul said, "If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God." I have, do not. I do not have the authority to, to 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 preach anything other than the Word of God. Now, there's some you can you can make admonitions. Of course, that's what the Word says: preach the Word, be ready in season, out of season. Which means there's no season for preaching. Preaching is to be, be, you be, you be ready at all times to preach the Word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. How? With great patience and teaching. We are to preach the Word. We are to reprove. That is to convict, to convince, to tell a fault. We are to rebuke. That is to censure or to admonish. We are to exhort. That means to call near, call to decide, to invite, to encourage. We are to preach the word. That is what we are to preach. Not only is preaching the word, uh, we are to declare all the counsel of God. That's 20 verses, six, uh, verses 26 and 27. The preacher does not have the right, or whoever standing here that's giving the message during worship, does not have the liberty to preach what he think, uh, to preach his, uh, to preach what he th uh, thinks he, th th uh, in other words, He's not to uh, preach a certain pet doctrines and leave out anything else. He's to preach the whole counsel of God. He can't look at the Word of God and say, well, I don't like that. I'm not going to preach that. that he can't do that because this is God's Word. I believe in a balance in preaching. In other words, I believe, I believe that it should be balanced, not just sticking on one topic. And we'll, we'll talk about that later on. In, in this. But we're to declare all the whole counsel of God. Notice this, Acts 20, 26, and 27. Paul said this, Therefore I test to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Paul said, I've preached you the word of God. I've still not declared everything that God wants you to know. Nothing is, is to be held back. The preacher, the one that's giving the message, is not to show partiality. First Timothy five twenty one. I can't just uh, preach something that might favor someone else and then ignore anything else of the needs of the congregation. I'm to be balanced. I'm to show no partiality because God shows no partiality. We are to preach on everything in the Bible because this is God's word. Number next, the one that's given, the one that's preaching, don't allow the fear of men to govern what he preaches. A preacher shouldn't feel like he's being bought as to, as, to, as to what he should preach and what he shouldn't preach. Amen. The preacher ultimately is a servant of God. Right. And I'm, I'm giving the Word of God to preach. <laughs> Jeremiah was told, Jeremiah, we see that in Jeremiah. Tell them what I say. Ezekiel, give them the preaching that I bid you. You see it in the Old Testament. Thus says the Lord. This is what God says. This is not what the, the church says. This is not what the eldership says. This is what God says. Because God has the authority in the church and God determines what is to be preached and that is the Word of God. The Word of God. Don't allow the fear of man to go. No, if you preach that topic, we're going to fire you. Well, fire me. The Word of God is what stands. And that's what I'm going to give an answer to. James 3, 1, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you shall incur the stricter judgment. Why? Because this message is not mine. It's God's. And I'm going to tell it the way He has given it. That is the authority. And there's several scriptures. The idea of the watchman, Ezekiel 3, If I fail to warn you of where an action may, may lead, then I am going to be just as guilty as you. But if I warn, the Bible tells me I have not only saved you, that, saved you, but I've also saved myself. That's what Paul tells Timothy. Tells Timothy, 
then pre- preaching His Word, you, sa- you shall save both yourself and them that hear you. Amen. We're after the, the saving of souls. This is not about a showmanship, and we'll see that later on as well. So the responsibility of the hearers in worship, let's, let's not only just focus upon the one that's doing the preaching, but also those that are hearing. The one that's hearing should try as, as their best if, if, they, uh, if they're unable to be on time. That gives respect to, to uh, not only that, but it gives decently and in order so that things can be set in order to do that. Not only that, be attentive. This is not a time to be thinking, what am I going to eat today for lunch? Although that sometimes it's hard, to th- it's, it's easy to be distracted because our minds can go that way. I've been there, I've done that. I'm, just, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of having done that before. But our minds should be, we should try as our, as our all to focus our, our minds upon the Word of God, to be attentive, to be ready, to be as 1 John 4 says, test the Spirit to see whether they're from God. How do you do that? By the Word of God, Acts 17 11. They search the Scriptures daily to see whether the things that are being said are so. They were attentive, and we are expected to be attentive in worship. And we are also, another responsibility of the hearers in worship is not to cause unnecessary distraction for other hearers. Because we're all here to learn the Word of God and how we can be more like Christ. We're all for that same goal. We have a short time on this earth, and and we want to learn as much as we can and to be the the best we can for God, to serve Him, to be good stewards of what God has given us, and and we have to be good stewards of our time. Ephesians uh, Ephesians 5.16 says to redeem the time. For the days are evil. When we should have the right attitude. John 4, 24. We must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Even if, if, you, even if you have the right doctrine, if you have the wrong attitude, that is not the correct way to worship. You have to have both attitude and doctrine. Not one or the other. It's both. And, 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 we, there, and there should be emotion in worship. But it shouldn't be all focused upon emotion. Uh, we, should, we should give respect to God's Word and receive the Word with, with joy, with gladness, and eager to grow. We are to be attentive. There are also false ideas, or false ideas, actions, and attitudes of preachers in worship. And we'll hit the other side as well. Number one, there could be an arrogance that's being said. Hey, I'm the preacher. I get to, do, I get to dictate what's said, and I'm going to use my pulpit as a bully thing. No. How's that partiality? I mean, how's that impartiality? This is not a time to browbeat people, calling out names, pointing the finger, you did this, you did that, you did this. That's not, that's not preaching. That's browbeating. And that will win nobody, no, no one. I'm speaking to myself to remind myself what my task is at this time. It's to deliver the word of Almighty God. A preacher is a mere servant of the congregation. A preacher is not the boss. I'm not the boss. Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 1.22. I don't run anything. Christ does. He's the one that says, you do this, you do that, you do this. And it specifies with His Word. I'm not the head of anything. I am not the preacher. I am a preacher. But I'm not the preacher of anything. I'm not, I'm not the pastor, as the world would say. Well, first of all, pastor is, is referring to elders, but I'm not a pastor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a anything. I am. I want to be just like Moses was called, the servant of the Lord. I am His slave. I belong to Him. He is my master. Amen. The slave is not above his master. Amen. The slave should know his place in the kingdom. We are all servants of the king. We are all masters are uh, all servants of the master he is our lord that's one of the fundamental that's one of the things that we do when we become a christian we, we confess him as lord he is the lord of my life i'm no longer my own again the preacher is not the boss even when right it should be that we should use merely to win an argument or to prove a point but rather to save souls I'm not here to win an argument. I don't care about winning an argument. I'm after winning your soul. What would it matter if I win an argument, but then your soul is lost? Guess what I'm going to have to do? Stand before God and answer? 
I'm after your soul. Because I want to save my own soul. I want to save your soul. That's what it's about. That's what, that's what the, our mission is. is to seek and to save that which was lost. That was Christ's mission. And it's the same mission of the church. James, and notice what James says about saving a soul. James 5, 29, or 5, 19, and 20. There is no 29 in James. James 5, 19 and 20 says, My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. It's after the salvation of souls. And we must always remember that. Those that are, those that are teaching. Number, big, uh, number next, hobby writing. As we've mentioned before, we must preach the whole counsel of God. Not just pet topics. Would it do any good if every, if every sermon, every time I got up to preach, I talked about Noah's Ark? What would that do any good? Not to say we can't preach on Noah's Ark, but that shouldn't be the message every single week. Because eventually it's like, oh man, why don't we got to go hear, hear about Noah's Ark again for the 30th or 5th time? That's not, going to be, that's not going to do any good. Again, I've always, I try to focus on the idea of balance. To preach the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. And not just something that I may like or maybe a pet topic. Just as we need different types of food for our essential nutrients. Now what if I just ate steak every day for my life and ate nothing else? I do, I would do nothing good for my body. Just like we need more different nutrients for our physical body. We cannot survive on just one element of our spiritual food. We need all of it. We need all of it. Don't hold anything back. Don't hold anything back. Number next, a big performance. Preaching is not a concert. This is not a show. I'm not up here just for your, uh, for your entertainment. I'm here for your soul. Or to save your soul. I'm here to, 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 to proclaim the Word of God. This responsibility is not to be taken lightly, James 3, 1, again. Some pander to our entertainment crazy society by diluting the word until it's barely recognizable. Sometimes the preaching of the word gives the hearers joy, but it must also prick the heart when necessary. Again, it's not wrong to be joyous. But sometimes, when, uh, there are times when we read the word, that there, as, as we read in John, it's difficult. But it must be said because it's part of the counsel of God. Right. There are things that are difficult that may, that may cause us to think a little bit. And, and we have to think... How does this apply to my life? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to change because the Word of God shows me who I am. And we need to be humble and willing to change. And many, give, many, many those that proclaim the gospel sometimes give in, however, to the many voices crying, Speak unto us smooth things, as Isaiah 30 and verse 10. What would it say to someone if I say, You don't have to do anything. I'll just preach to you everything that, you, that would tickle your ears. And, and that, that, that was it. And then get on the day of judgment. on the day of judgment, thinking I've heard the word of God preached. No, you didn't. There's a grave responsibility to preach the word of God. I didn't tell you exactly the way the Bible says all of it. I'm not here just to. I'm not here just to cater to someone's whims. I'm here to preach the gospel. And others feel they must solicit applause and amens. Amen is a statement of agreement and should not be squeezed out of someone. I've seen it time and time again where someone gets up, can I get an amen? That's not what I'm here for. Who cares if someone says amen or not? I would hope you would agree with what the Word of God says, but whether you say it verbally or say it in your mind, or, or just uh, think, yeah, I agree with that. I don't preach for amens. Amen. And then another thing is, we don't applause in worship. Applause is what you do at ball games. This is worship. This this is a this is a time to worship God, and and some even and there's there are several things that could distract us, and we have to remember what's authorized in worship. And remember, those gathered are not an audience of people anxious to see the next show, but brethren concerned about their souls, the souls of others, and pleasing God through acceptable worship. And I have to remember that always. I'm not here just to say, I'm not here to display my, my knowledge of how much Greek I know. I'm not displaying my knowledge of how many verses I've memorized. 
I'm here to preach the Word of God. And I hope that's what's, what comes across every single time I preach. I'm constantly trying to work on my craft. I'm not, I'm not all that in the bag of chips. I am, I'm not there. The day I'm there is the day I die. Because I'm always will be working. And I hope that you're doing the same. Always be working to better ourselves to be more like Christ. Amen. And it's not just about just preacher, but also the one that's hearing the sermon. There are false actions and ideas that happen then. It's like the preacher wants a desire to big performance. It may be the case that someone that sits in the audience may desire the big performance. Let's see what, what kind of knowledge he has. Let's see what verse he's going to quote for us today. That, let's, not, let's not do that. Of course, I, I'm talking to an audience that I don't believe that's focused upon that. I'm confident that I'm, that I'm focused upon those that are looking after their soul. And that's what we need to do. It's just reminding us of some things. It could be that some may not be paying attention, has mind on other things. Again, where are we going to eat for lunch? I wonder who's winning the game right now, etc. Picking the preacher apart from mannerisms or mistakes in grammar and pronunciation while missing the entire message. Or maybe someone saying, well, not, uh, and focusing upon one point, so that you missed the whole entire lesson. I'm a, I'm a fallible human being. I can, I can make grammar mistakes. It's like everyone here probably would make a grammar mistake. I'm not going to look at someone different and say, well, you misspelled this word or mispronounced this. It's about the message. It's about the message. I need it. I, 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 I appreciate when you tell me at the end of, this, end of the lesson, that was a good sermon. But the one I like the, the, the most is, I needed that today. If I can help you, that's, that's the goal. Through the Word of God. Well, it's the Word of God that helps you. I'm just, I'm just His servant that delivers it. But if that's what you get out of it, that's, that, will make me, that makes me happy. Because you've got it. And, there, there, and, there, and then of course, there are sermons that are easier to listen to than others. And sometimes you have to chew on things. But it's being done for a reason. Number, number next, being more concerned with the sermon's length than its content. Sometimes it's just not possible to say everything within 20 or 30 minutes. Remember what we read in, 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 in Ezra. Or Ezra read, from, he started from mid-morning all the way to afternoon. That's more than 30 minutes. Now, the preacher should respect the, the time of the audience, but that shouldn't be our entire concern. You know, uh, you, you know if you, you've seen my sermons, I don't normally go over 30, 35 minutes. I'm right there within the confines of time. But our focus is upon the quantity of the message, the quality of the message, than it is its length. <laughs> I like this point. Some brethren should, should be glad they do not have Paul as their preacher. Paul preached at midnight. Now, of course, again, we don't know when he started, but nonetheless. And another uh, false idea that the hearer may have is not receiving the word. In other words, some people may... Here's, a, here's an admission for all of us, including myself. Just because you're sitting in the pew does not mean you're all there. You can sit there and just go through the motions. But let's have our hearts into it. Amen. Let's seek the best out of everyone. And let's seek to learn and to, and to be, be nourished and to be growing in Christ. Let's all have that heart. And I hope and I, I trust that that's your goal today. And another one is receiving it well but not carrying it out. It's one thing to receive the Word. It's another thing to, to apply it. Amen. So when you hear a sermon preached, look at ways that you can, you can work on what's being said. Now, okay, I, need to, I need to turn, say for example, let's go back to last week's a little bit. I need to internalize the Word of God. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to be more attentive. I'm going to follow along. I'm, I'm perhaps going to take the notes. And, and, and I know I go fast. But I, I, I think, uh, here's, here's a way to help you. Help, help you a little bit. Maybe you miss a, a verse or so. And if you listen for the verse a little bit, write down the verse and then, then listen to the statement a little bit. And so, and it, it, it's not always easy to get every single verse that the preacher said. I've been, I've been there, done that. My, most of my instructors sometimes, I would miss their, the, 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 the reference they gave because they would go fast as well. So I've been there. I, 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 I've, I've seen that. I've, I've, it's happened in my life. But I love everything I've given. Everything I can receive. Because I want to grow. Because that's my attitude. Preaching, hearing, is an essential part of our worship. Preaching, like all acts of worship, should not be done flippantly and thoughtlessly. 
There is, and I know this statement is true. I don't know who it said it, but it said poor preparation produces poor performance. That's right. Proper preparation produces proper performance. Actually, it'd be better to say proper preparation produces proper reactions. And because there, there is a thought process that's taken, taken care of. Sometimes, not, not all lessons that we, if you've ever tried to give a lesson or to study for a lesson, perhaps a Bible class or, or anything, you know how, how difficult it is to come up with, with some things. Because not every sermon or class that you teach is going to be easy. There's going to be things that you have to think about a little bit and, and more, and that takes a lot of preparation. And we should appreciate those that teach class and appreciate those that, that study because that is hard work. Preaching is work. Paul said, do the work of an evangelist. There's a lot of work. And by the way, preaching is not all done from the pulpit. Preaching is to be done in homes and houses and our conversations. And there's a lot to preaching than just the pulpit. And let us, let us be just as serious. Uh, the, the hearers, let you be just as serious in your duty as to hear the message as the preacher is in his preaching. It, let, let us both be working to better ourselves that we can properly be good stewards of God's Word and to be more like Christ. That's the goal, to be like Christ. You're not to be, I, don't want to, I don't want to draw you to me. I want you to draw you to the cross. That's right. And that's, that, that's the goal, to draw you to Jesus, not to me. I don't want you to flippantly follow me like a herd of cattle. Test what I have to say with the Word of God so that you can grow. And let's all be working on that. You may have a need to respond this morning. If you've never heard the, the Word of God, we, I, I implore you, be willing to study. Study with us so that you can become a Christian. Maybe you've already become a Christian, but you need to respond publicly. If you need to this morning, please come now as we stand and as we sing.